Hello and welcome to LiveWire's Outlook series for 2024. I'm Sarah Allen, and today I'm here with StockSpot's Chris Breike. Today, we're going to be discussing the Australian ETF landscape and how you can use them in your portfolio. Chris, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So to begin with, the Australian ETF market is now worth over $165 billion, quite explosive growth. What trends have you been seeing? I mean, there's been a few in the last few years. I mean, the rapid growth that you mentioned is one of them. The, the assets under management every year just keeps on growing faster and faster. And compared to when I set up StockSpot 10 years ago, it's grown from 10 billion to 160. So that's obviously huge growth. I mean, in the more specific sort of trends, one of them would be that the big broad market indices um, type of ETFs have all been quite aggressive in cutting fees. And part of this, I think, is to drive headlines. They want to have the lowest cost, you know, ASX ETF or global ETF. Um, because that helps them get eyeballs to their businesses and then obviously offer other types of products. Um, but I also think it shows the economies of scale they've been getting as well. So, you know, reduced costs at that high, um, you know, those large um, broad market ETFs is one. Um, the other interesting trend is there's a few more conversions from active funds into that ETF structure. I think a lot of the active funds are realizing the benefits of having that open-ended, transparent, listed structure, and a lot of investors are demanding it these days. So we're seeing a few more conversions from other types of you know, vehicle into the ETF structure, and that's happening more and more. And then thematic ETFs. So there's a lot of growth happening uh, more on the issuer space rather than the asset side. Um, on the asset side, we are still seeing 90% going to the broad market ETFs, but there's a lot more listings in the thematic space, all sorts of different ETFs available. Um, in more sort of specific niche um, sectors of the market. Okay, and there's been record numbers of new ETFs being listed across the past couple of years. Are you using any of them? Uh, we're generally focusing on the, the long-term diversified low-cost ETFs in our portfolio. So, you know, we like the ETFs that have long track records that provide exposure to lots of different sectors different countries, asset classes, currencies, because diversification you know, really is the benefit we're trying to give our clients. Um, so a lot of these specific ones, you know, although they can have fantastic runs up and a lot of them do double in a year and you'll often see them in the best of lists, you know, we also see a lot of these thematic ETFs having huge drawdowns of 50 or 80% as well. So you know, we think they're, you know, they're quite an efficient way of speculating compared to buying individual shares and slightly less risky. Um, but we don't think really for our types of portfolios they're necessary for investors. What innovations have you been seeing across the ETF market and you, what are you expecting to see in the next few years? I mean, my, I think the big innovation that still hasn't really seeped into the Aussie market 50 years after it happened is that discovery of the cost matters hypothesis in investing. So the fact that even though markets may be efficient or inefficient, the mathematical certainty of investing is that the return people receive um, on average will be the market return minus any cost they've paid. And I think as investors, you know, really appreciate the impact of costs on investing, it's driving a lot more money into these low cost diversified products. And, and that's really the innovation that's gonna stand the test of time. And I think it's the real secular innovation over the last, you know, many decades, which is gonna see more and more assets move from, you know, that active high cost world into the passive low cost world. You know, there are other more technical innovations that have happened. Um, you know, Magellan really drove one of them, which was this move into the ETF structure for active products, um, you know, where they were comfortable that they could, you know, maintain the IP within their portfolios, but still provide that listed liquid structure that trades close to net tangible assets. And that's probably the other one that's, you know, a bit unique in Australia. We're seeing a lot of active funds getting pressure from their investors um, because of their closed end structure leads to a big discount on net tangible assets um, that can be closed if they actually switch that into an ETF structure. And so I think that's the other interesting innovation that's really positive for investors. And if you are an investor in one of these funds trading at a discount, it makes sense to put pressure on your manager for a more investor friendly structure. Okay, so turning to one of the big stories of 2023 was inflation. How can you use ETFs to manage inflation in your portfolio? So I think it was the big trend probably of last year and this year, but we've probably seen the flip side this year. So last year there was a lot of concerns about inflation getting out of control and we obviously saw inflation rising in, in a lot of developed markets, you know, the US, Australia, the UK, um, and then a lot of the asset classes that 
you know, benefit from rising or accelerating inflation benefited. So, you know, in 2022, we saw commodities being one of the best asset classes, um, whereas, you know, long duration assets like tech shares that are really benefiting from long term growth, um, they did very poorly. You know, this year it's been the opposite. Technology has been the best performing part of the market, whereas commodities have done badly. But I, feel, I still think there is that concern out there that um, inflation might be more persistent than people expect. And, you know, history would certainly suggest that once inflation gets out of the box, you know, which it has, you know, it's still close to 5% in Australia. It takes a long time to get back down into that three to, uh, 2 to 3% range. Historically, that's taken four to 16 years. And so I think, you know, there'll be continued um, interest in ETFs that give exposure to asset classes that have historically benefited from higher inflation. You know, and those are commodities, um, resource shares, um, precious metals, um, inflation and protected bonds, um, and also infrastructure. Um, and the ETF landscape, you know, is, is, you know, fantastic for getting exposure to these assets because you can get that access in a low cost format. Okay, and what are some of your favourite picks for inflation ETFs? Well, I mean, one that's been in our portfolios for 10 years now is the gold ETF. Um, so it's, it's a fabulous diversifier, I think, in a portfolio. So where, you know, traditionally bonds are seen as the diversifier for shares. That has worked over 30 years while there's been a negative correlation between bonds and shares. You know, when shares have had a big fall, you know, often central banks have cut interest rates and that's helped the bond market. Um, but that's not happening at the moment or in the last crisis, you know, over 2022, when the bond market was actually the driver due to concerns about higher interest rates and inflation, and then the share market did badly as well. Um, you know, inflation is a driver of potentially both of those asset classes continuing to move in the same direction. And historically, when that happens, asset classes like gold are like the insurance on your insurance. Um, so that's one we like. You know, there's other commodity focused ETFs that actually give access to commodity futures, which are quite interesting as well. Um, but then also just the very traditional resource share ETFs that have been around for a long time that give access to the ASX 200 resource shares. Um, you know, those ones are ones that we, we think are good ones for investors. Um, infrastructure, you know, interestingly hasn't done that well, even in a, um, you know, an environment of concerns around inflation. Um, but, you know, it may do better in other types of, um, you know, inflation focused markets. And then inflation protected bonds is the other one. So, I mean, we like all of those ones um, for investors that have a goal of um, protecting against inflation. Okay. And off the back of inflation concerns, income's been a big concern for many investors. Can you use ETFs to generate income for your portfolio? You definitely can, although I'd say there's a few things that investors need to look out for when they're trying to focus their ETF portfolio on income. Um, and, and the two that we see that are pretty important would be, first of all, you know, making sure that you've, you're in an ETF that's well diversified, because there's a lot of quite concentrated income ETFs that are very volatile. The other one is making sure that you're not sacrificing um, capital returns when you're focusing on income. Because what we see in the ETF space is that there's a lot of products out there that advertise a very high headline return, um, a high headline dividend return, and that might, might be 7% or 8% or 9%. So it's, it's very appealing for investors and particularly you know, self-managed super funds and people that are trying to draw an income. But a lot of these products are structured products where they're basically stealing from one side of the equation, the capital return side, to give to the dividend side of the equation. So you're stealing from Peter to give to Paul, it's, it's a bit of, an, a bit of a math trick really. Um, but in the end, investors are paying high fees for these products. And the real part of the return that they need to focus on, which is the total return, the sum of both of those, is actually lower than just the more simple diversified ETFs. Um, so on the income space, you know, we still like the very low cost products out there, like the Vanguard High Yield Fund. You know, and on the global space, there's a um, State Street dividend product that we like as well. Um, you know, diversification, you know, spread across lots of sectors of the market, but also there's no sort of trickery involved in actually, um, you know, dressing up the dividend to be higher than it is. Okay. Now, a few years back, you said to us, you only need five ETFs to outperform the market. Do you still believe that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, our philosophy at Stockspot is that boring is brilliant. And actually, you know, most everyday investors can beat almost all of the professionals um, simply by having the discipline to do nothing most of the time. But I think that's where it gets really tricky because it is so hard to just sit on your hands and not do anything when there are constant temptations out there to, you know, buy something else, to sell something, to act. 
Um, and we you know, read about these temptations all the time, an earnings release here, you know, some market forecaster predicting a market crash, um, but the best thing for most people to do is absolutely nothing. You know, once you're set in a low cost diversified portfolio, and then remember um, you know, in the end that costs are the biggest drag on your performance versus the market returns. Mm -hmm. If you can just set your costs low, um, diversify well and try not to predict the market but rather prepare for different types of environments. Um, you know, we think that's what's going to set investors up for success. Um, you know, having been around for 10 years now, like the track record that we've developed shows that it's ultimately the case that you don't need complexity. You know, you don't need a lot of, you know, funky asset classes in your portfolio to drive good quality returns. Although it's not a popular message in the industry because, um, you know, the finance industry really relies on complexity. Okay, and it's still the same five ETFs? Same five ETFs, we haven't changed them in 10 years. Okay, excellent. And into the coming year, are you changing up any of your allocations at all? No, so in 10 years, as well as keeping the same five core ETFs, we've only changed our strategic asset allocation twice in 10 years. So, you know, very long-term strategic asset allocation. And where we've made those two changes, it's because there's been changes in the relationships between the asset classes, um, because that's what's required, you know, having more of a defensive asset or less of a defensive asset to give you a smoother path. Um, so it's not something we expect to change very often. Um, we are reviewing them all the time, so I couldn't tell you if we are or aren't going to change them next okay. year. But no, we're not changing you know, tactical allocations every month or every quarter like a lot of investment banks do or others that are you know, trying to predict whether emerging markets are better or developed markets or growth or defensive assets. We don't try and predict because we think that really doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, 50% of predictions by financial you know, experts turn out not to be the case. Mm -hmm. And I think the 50% that do turn out, people think that it's due to skill when in a lot of cases it's just luck anyway. So, you know, we don't think it makes sense to tactically pick things. Um, instead, just do nothing and we think investors will do better. Okay. So finally, what are your top three tips for investors looking at ETFs? Well, I think, I mean, one of the big tips I've mentioned before is, um, you know, import, important focus area f for any sort of investment is costs. Um, but don't just focus on the advertised fee because when it comes to ETFs, there are other costs involved as well. So, you know, you have to cross a spread when you're buying and selling and that can be wider or closer for different ETF providers. You know, you need to think about the liquidity available. You know, are there going to be buyers and sellers there when you want to buy and sell? Um, and, and these are the sorts of other costs you have to incorporate into your cost decision. So for people out there looking at the big broad ETFs that are all pretty low cost these days, you know, four basis points, five, six, ten basis points. You know, you want to consider all of these other costs as well. And even the turnover within the portfolio is important to consider because the tax consequences of turnover, um, you know, leads to a cost for investors. You know, so cost is an important one. Um, think about diversification across your whole portfolio and be careful about um, double up. Um, diversification, which I would define as when someone has lots of different things in their portfolio, but they're all ultimately the same thing. Um, so we get a lot of clients come to us asking for us to review their portfolios. And when we do review their portfolios, um, they're often surprised when we say, actually, you don't have a lot of diversification because they'll say, look, we've got 20 different funds in there. But if you look at the underlying shares within each of these funds, there's a lot of overlap. So really, if you are building a portfolio, making sure the underlying assets and shares within your portfolio are different is important. But not only different, that they're going to do, um, do well and badly in different types of markets. So you're going to have a, a more of a smooth um, path. Um, because something we've also seen over the last few years is managers that have a big focus on where, one area, like you know, tech shares or you know, a value shares, you, know, you tend to have very big drawdowns as well because you know, one area of the market like that can do very well for a while but then do very poorly as well. Um, so that would be my second tip. You know, the, and the last tip you know, really goes back to something else I was saying is you know, there's always temptations to do something and next year will be no different. You know, there'll be someone that says there's, there's about to be a recession. There'll be, you know, unfortunately, you know, unrest in other parts of the world. You know, there's an election coming up in the US, so there'll be lots of people making predictions about that. But if you can avoid the temptation to listen to predictions and simply focus on, you know, having the discipline to do nothing, you're going to be really well off over the long run. Okay, so that's fees, diversification and tune out the noise. That's my tips. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your insights with us today, Chris. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> If you've enjoyed that interview, please subscribe to Livewire Markets to hear more from our Outlook series for 2024. Thank you for watching.